Welcome to the Dispense Magazine podcast. I'm your host, Sven Hosford, bringing you news and information about medical cannabis. In this podcast series, we talk about the things you and your doctor might talk about. In this episode, we talk with a practicing physician who also happens to be the chief medical officer of Vireo Health. We spoke to Dr. Stephen Dahmer at the Mind Body Holistic Healing Expo in Monroeville, Pennsylvania on March 30th, 2019. During our wide ranging interview, we cover the entourage effect, or as he prefers to call it, the ensemble effect, along with why cannabis and holistic therapies work so well together, and why he's so excited to be working with the physician led company, Vireo Health. Here's our conversation from the expo floor. So we're here at the Mind Body Holistic Healing Expo, and I have great pleasure of talking with Dr. Stephen Dahmer, who is the Chief Medical Officer at uh, Vireo, Vireo Health, and now Vireo, Pennsylvania is their the local business. Welcome. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Just an absolute pleasure. Having a lot of fun and uh, checking out different booths, meeting a lot of people. I'm uh, doing some uh, dispensary trainings here in the area, and uh, it's great to be here. Oh, thanks. Yeah, is it your first trip to Pittsburgh? It's my second trip. Uh, okay. And, and enjoying it. I grew great. up in uh, Wisconsin, and, you know, sure. a lot of similarities. Very similar, yeah, yeah. Now, you're a company out of uh, Minnesota, your headquarters in Minneapolis, right? Absolutely. Yeah, Vireo Health was founded by Dr. Kyle Kingsley uh, okay. in Minnesota, and the story goes that around a table of uh, farmers in uh, his hometown of Harmony, Minnesota, that Kyle started uh, at that time, uh, yeah, Vireo Health, um, and then he brought me on board a little bit later. Now you have uh, the top four positions, the top four executives are all doctors, is that right? Or? No, we have four full-time physicians on staff. On staff and, okay. you know, it's a really team-based approach. To, I don't know about the top four. Or, okay. you know, we kind of come together as a team, but four full-time physicians that are really giving their input and actively working uh, in yeah. Vireo Health to, to offer the best products we can to patients. And what was it about that conversation Dr. Uh, Kyle had with those farmers? That what, what was the spark there? What was it that really got him going? Yeah, you know, I, I think we'll have to ask Kyle on that, that on a different uh, a podcast. Different podcast okay. But, you know, Kyle, and, and uh, the story goes, and, and Kyle will tell you a different story, but he and I had met uh, on a medical exchange to Cuba uh, almost 20 years ago. Oh, wow. okay. And we were up uh, late at night arguing. I, my background is in integrative medicine. Sure. So the holistic health expo is right up my alley. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, we'd have uh, pretty heated debates. Uh, but Kyle's a very uh, uh, a good convincer. You know, he really comes about things from, with a real uh, rounded perspective, um, really wants to base uh, everything he does in, in medicine and science and have good facts to back it up. Yet that, um, you know, I call it Midwestern, but I think it, it works for all of us. But that pragmatic mm-hmm. angle as well, that you know, while science and, and medicine is the background, but this has to work for people and the way that fits into their lifestyle and that they'll accept. Now, um, you know, I'm having arguments with people all the time about all different kinds of subjects, but one that just came up was um, I might find myself on a radio program here soon where the host believes that only CBD is useful in healing. The THC has no useful healing properties at all. Can you debunk that pretty quickly? Yeah, I mean, this, this is the fun part of the industry, right? <laughs> that there is so such polarizing opinions uh, yeah. on that. And I, I really, uh, I take a little offense to that. And um, actually just came back, uh, just came from Minnesota, where I lectured to the Minnesota Academy of Family Physicians with another physician that is a certifying phys- physician there. Uh, and the title of the talk was How Medical is Cannabis? And, uh, and, you know, one of the things that we talk about is, and I think we're going to get into this maybe a little bit more, is that idea of an entourage effect. Mm-hmm, and exactly. from a physician standpoint, the vast majority of evidence, and that's, you know, what drives us is what research has been done and what is the evidence behind any treatment that we use with a patient. Mm-hmm. But the vast majority of that has been done on THC. Oh, yeah, yeah. For, for better or for worse. And so of the, of the compounds of these amazing 140-plus uh, phytocannabinoids, right, that exist within this plant, the one that has been most studied for medicinal benefit is THC. Okay. And, uh, and as you well know, too, and having a background in holistic medicine, mm-hmm. we see these uh, kind of exciting molecules come and go uh, almost every day. And I'm not right. saying that CBD is only that. Uh, but right. we do like to kind of base our treatment in that which has been studied the most. And the fun thing about the entourage is it's not either or. Right, right, I know, I know. Well, it seems like the key thing for a lot of the studies right now is also to find that right ratio, 
uh, and you guys do it on your products as well, that uh, is one to one or 19 to one, the THC to right. CBD. So there's a lot of evidence that the CBD and the THC work very well together and have different, they'd have different effects based on that ratio. Is that about right? Certainly, and you know that's something that I'm very interested. In. I mean, I think we're all here today because of this concept called entourage. Yeah. We know that since 1985, there's an FDA-approved medication that is not Schedule One that a patient can get a prescription from their father, uh, from their uh, from their physician, uh, to treat uh, a disease, or, or you know, and, and they can get that from their their physician. And we just know that uh, patients don't find that as effective. Mm -hmm. We're we talking see, about Marinol. Talking about Marinol. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and and what we do see is is patients gravitating, you know, towards the whole plant extract, mm -hmm. uh, a plant that has some estimates co-evolved co with us for tens of thousands of years, if right. not more. Right. Um, and and utilizing this whole plant that science is starting to pan out, in my opinion, right, this is heavily debated, that these uh, these molecules interact with each other in a, in a synergistic form, right, and that we call the entourage. And I, um, I have trouble with that term a little bit because entourage means one leader, right, and we're ass assuming THC is the leader. Yeah, yeah. I like the term ensemble because it's more of a of an orchestra, right, yeah. that's coming together and creating this magic in the human body. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was there a movie called Entourage? Was it the yeah, TV yeah, it was shows? an HBO, yeah, yeah, it was yeah, an HBO okay. special. And yeah, and that was kind of silly. I mean, that, again, it's not one liter. It's, um, is it safe to, to call THC the leader, though? I mean, it's not really. Is it the most active of the active ingredients? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, uh, it's the one that we know the most about its activity, and yeah, that's yeah. why I'm having trouble with that entourage. Yeah, so yeah. We're given it that lead position uh, because it was the troublemaker, yeah, right? Exactly. Uh, for so many years, it was a troublemaker, so we're given it that uh, lead singer position, and, and maybe, uh, you know, and again, I'm, I'm saying THC certainly has benefits, uh, but maybe we should give some of the other players a little bit more of a lead role, and I think that's one of the things we're really trying to do at Vireo is put the science behind uh, so much of this gray area that we're operating in the dark. And, and that's right. really the excitement that I bring to uh, the cannabis industry in my background in family medicine is a patient walks through that dispensary door, how do we find the right product? How do right. we find the right ratio as you were uh, speaking to before? How do we find the right dose? Even more important for right. me, uh, depending on that illness that they're bringing to the table. And, and that's something that we're absolutely uh, laser focused on and helping yeah. our patients do that. And as you probably know, I've even created things from the starter pack, mm -hmm. which allows patients to kind of uh, test on their own uh, right. a multiple, uh, a few products, actually three products, three of our, our, our best used products for treating pain. Um, to really standardizing the product to even the terpenoid level, mm -hmm. that we know exactly what's in that medicine, and when that patient mm -hmm. comes back uh, two weeks later, uh, they'll get the exact same medicine again. Well, let's, let's talk about the entourage effect, because um, I, I think it comes with uh, it's very much a double-edged sword in that, um, you know, these are the, this is the uh, effect of the combination of these different chemicals but that makes it extremely hard to study because cannabis has so many different strains and there's so many different variables. Is that basically why, one of the big reasons why it's so difficult to, to identify like which terpenes have what effect and what are the great combinations? Yeah, and, and I think a good um, comparison is made that you know, when we speak of cannabis, we're not talking about a single drug. Right. We're right. talking about uh, hundreds, you know, if not thousands, as we start to put together different combinations of, of drugs, right, yeah. or medications, uh, as I prefer to call them. And that is exactly what makes it so difficult to study and why in the history of the FDA, right, medications that I have at my disposition as a physician, uh, we've now had, you know, three botanicals that have made it through the process. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what we do from a medical perspective is we focus on a single chemical. Right, right. And that's what our medications, uh, for the most part, are. And that's why I think like this is such an interesting time that we're in that for the first time we're again starting to embrace plant medicine with yeah. this thought that this ensemble entourage of 
chemicals could have a different impact on the human body yeah. than if we just pull one out and give it in a high dose. Exactly. This, I think, is the great, uh, the great excitement in, in cannabis, what you're going to talk about tomorrow here on The Entourage Effect. Give us a little thumbnail sketch of what exactly you're going to talk about and how that works. Uh, you know, when, every time that I approach a lecture, the, you know, the, there are always extreme extremes to how we uh, think about any idea, right? And, and there'll be a, a camp on either side, and the truth lies somewhere in between. And I try to paint those two extremes. Let me give you an example with the entourage effect. Um, I certainly will talk about the science that supports how these uh, these phytocannabinoids work in synergy. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about uh, how it's absolutely fascinating to me that the two most prevalent cannabinoids in this plant have opposite effects. Yeah. THC makes your heart race. It could be, you know, it can trigger psychosis in very high dosages. It, uh, you know, uh, can affect cognition, and CBD does the exact opposite. And mm -hmm. this plant is smart enough, you know, to create these two compounds that have opposite effects in the human body to try to help us towards homeostasis, mm -hmm. right, or balance. Mm -hmm. um, and and it also has a softer effect. That if you looked at it from a you know biochemical perspective, how a phytocannabinoid binds in our receptors, it's a softer binding, mm -hmm. right, as opposed to the synthetic cannabinoid kind of bind and don't release. And that's okay. where we see many with K2 and Spice in these uh, illegal synthetic cannabinoids. They're much more intense. We see you know, patients that can even die from these. Yeah. And so we have a plant that offers this kind of beautiful uh, synergy with our own system in our body in a softer, more subtle way that I think medicine has missed out by just pulling out one chemical. But th that's a great point, too. And it also kind of prevents... Uh, because of that entourage effect in cannabis, it kind of prevents or diminishes the possibility of uh, pharmaceutical companies doing just that, pulling a few things out, uh, getting that almighty uh, patent, which everybody goes for, right. so that they can make money. How, how are you, as, a, as a, a grower processor, how do you get... What am I trying to ask? How do you connect, uh, how do you get uh, products that have a similar kind of thing as a, as a uh, not a copyright, but a patent? I mean, you have your own uh, strains, you have your own processing to put it together. Okay, well, I, mean, I think, I think maybe there. if I could maybe jump in the, yeah. what you're asking, well, how do we, you know, protect the work that we're doing, right? And, and as a, bus as a yeah. business, you know, how do we, how do we guard uh, for all this hard work we're doing? Yeah. And I'll be honest, you know, we certainly approach IP in a very uh, smart fashion. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think, you know, protecting a specific plant or strain is the direction to go. And I think, uh, and I'll speak maybe for myself on behalf of the company as well, far more interested in threading that needle. Because mm -hmm. we're talking about, we have uh, our background in, in, in medicine and board certified and the FDA process is so much at odds with the holistic expo yeah. and the cannabis industry and yeah. a whole plant extract and, and each side is kind of staring each other down and, and giving each other dirty looks and this has been my role in integrative medicine <laughs> sure, for a sure. long time. Very why why are we giving each other dirty looks? What if there is a, a, a middle path right. and we see that in the nutraceutical industry potentially, mm -hmm. right? That's a, it's, mm -hmm trying to approximate that pharmaceutical approach, how do we start to thread that needle on a product that both physicians, wow, a, a non-existent LD50, something that works on the body's own endogenous system in a subtle manner that patients can take for a long period of time and they're not going to die from, mm -hmm. start to you know, work together with the patients that have seen such amazing, I mean, right at the table here where we're starting, this right. has changed my life. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that story. Yep. How many times we start, how do we start to bring these two polarizing sides together with a new path that, wow, this could really be amazing benefiting everyone. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, um, it's been my experience that once doctors learn about the endocannabinoid system, that seems to be like the, the, the switch that turns them on to like, uh, from, you know, stigma and reefer madness over to, oh, maybe there is something here. Is that your experience? I, I think there are many things, and I've been doing this for four years, lecturing to physicians now. I think that is one, uh, to see that the system exists and that we're harnessing that with the phytocannabinoids. But I think there are other important things as well, that this is uh, medicine I can trust, mm -hmm. that it's third-party tested. And I know there's a lot of concern, and I even listened to your last podcast about, you know, with, with Jihan Jan about mm -hmm. CBD that we might find on the street and what's in right. there. So it's got to be a, a trust 
tested product. And then right. that third kind of uh, leg, I would say, for physicians is efficacy. Yeah. Yeah. That's where research will come in, and you know we are really excited to be participating with uh, Montefiore, who received an NIH grant of three point eight million dollars to study opioids, cannabis, and chronic pain. Oh, that's awesome! Um, and, and so we need to kind of push those three areas for the the physician side to get on, and then it, back to your question of you know how do we do that in terms of even formulation mm -hmm. uh, on the patient side? You know we want a whole plan. Right, right. Well, then that's where you're you're kind of trusting that nature, in its wisdom, put together all the right chemicals in that plant, and that they all work together, like you said, with the THC and the CBD. What are the other main phytochem? Uh, what are the other chemicals that are in there, the terpenes and things that you are finding most effective? Yeah, I mean, honestly, we don't know. But we don't even what is most effective. And that yeah. is where, in part, we have to trust, you know, what nature has put together. Mm -hmm. And some of the trust uh, is reinforced by, like, the Minnesota Department of Health has done great research on all patients going through the program, showing that 90% of them that come through our dispensary doors are achieving some benefit. So, right, the endocannabinoid system and this entourage effect mm -hmm. allow for this big kind of target where we're throwing darts and they're hitting. Mm -hmm. And now what we want to do is really start to hone in, because your endocannabinoid system is different from mine. Right. That, mm -hmm. uh, that dispensary's product is different from the other one. Right. But we can start to hone in on a standardized product, do a little bit better research projects that might even include like crowdsourcing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that we need big sets of data to start to hone in on what product works best for which person uh, with which disease. And then you throw in do uh, dosages, but also delivery systems. Right. You're throwing in even more variables into the system. It's it's a real complicated mess to study. Yeah. Not to mention, you know, anything that's psychotropic to create a placebo becomes very challenging as well. So our traditional RCT not only is it near impossible to, right. to do here in right. the United States, and I can attest to that from personal experience, but will it give us the best answer? Yeah. Is uh, do you see the potential that this plant could change medicine, how medicine is perceived by doctors, to get them to think outside the pharmaceutical box, to start thinking about whole plant medicine, to start thinking about allowing their patients to have more autonomy and making the decisions for their own health. Are you seeing those kinds of things happen yet? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah that's a great leading question. I certainly <laughs> hope so, right? It's, the medical establishment is tough to move, and, and yeah. for good reason. They have lives to protect, we have lives to protect, and, sure. and there's a reason why we can be conservative and, you know, and also very cautious with new things that come down the pike. And so I understand 110% of, uh, all you know, the reasons why we don't fully embrace this, mm -hmm. but I certainly hope, and we're seeing this in the medical community, patient-centered care. You know, that a patient's right. starting to run the show, team-based approach, mm -hmm. right? That it's mm -hmm. not just the almighty physician, that it's a team that's approaching the patient. Uh, the patient is engaged in that care. Uh, you know, starting to explore modalities outside from pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. outside the realm mm -hmm. of pharmaceuticals. And, you know, we've seen from probiotics to, you know, potentially, you know, fish oil or melatonin or other things that were at one time, time deemed uh, nutraceuticals and not under the, you know, the auspice of a physician's care, now move into that realm. And mm -hmm. so to answer your question, I certainly hope so. Yeah. And I think it's that interplay that gets us to that right uh, truth spot or approximates that because on either side, sometimes we're entrenched in our own bias. And, and there's some habits, I think, for doctors uh, to, to hard to break. Like, um, I mean, the fact that nobody has ever died in the history of humanity from the marijuana overdose. Does that get through to doctors? Is that something that they even like seriously consider before they start to raise all their doubts? I, you know, and I am still a practicing clinician, um, so I'll, I'm going to say yes because I still am a doctor that practices medicine. Mm -hmm. And I mention that in pretty much every lecture that I give. It, the criticism you'll get to that, or, or the contra that you'll get, is well, that doesn't make it a medicine that I'm going to recommend. You know, mm -hmm. like there's a lot of things that don't kill people. That doesn't mean I give that to them. Right. So I right. think I do think that that's a fantastic starting point, especially where we see, uh, I think I just read recently, it's the number one leading cause of death of Americans under 50 are pharmaceuticals, yeah. right? the majority yeah. of that opioids, but it, we are just killing so many people with pharmaceuticals and we're certainly seeing a mistrust of the pharmaceutical industry because of some of the things that have happened that the, the timing is right yeah. for that barometer to move a little bit. Yeah. Well, I, I think it, the timing is right on a lot of levels. You know, we're, we're seeing the end basically of the 
the honeymoon, if you want to call it that, with pharmaceuticals, like in the 90s where they thought, well, it's just a panacea, we'll just give them to everybody. And now we're seeing, you know, really the downside of that. And we're also, most people, I think, are coming around to the idea that maybe cannabis is not so dangerous as we were told when we were younger. I think, and I think there are many other layers. We talk about opioids quite a bit, and mm -hmm. um, you know, opioids I think certainly have a role in medicine. And, and uh, you know, I'm not going to defend opioids and, and everything that is happening with those. Well, when you need them, you need them. I mean, when you need yeah. them, you need them, and I think they're incredibly effective at treatment. But they are also the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there is really our benzodiazepines and sedative hypnotics, and now we have even stimulants added to that pack. And yeah. and to you know, to even mix the pot a little bit more, we're now dealing with polypharmacy. And that's where, you know, our elder population are on five, six, seven, eight different medications yeah. that interact with another, one another and can cause problems, which is also why I think our fastest growing demographics in, demographic in cannabis, medical cannabis, is that elder population. Right. So I don't want six drugs, you know, and, and right. the cannabis can help me sleep and help with those pains and um, help me get through the day. And, 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 and I'm at least convinced that it seems more natural than many of these that I'm taking. And I'd like to see more lines of research to either support or refute that. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and yeah, many people are, are, would much prefer the side effects of cannabis, which is, you know, feeling of euphoria and an appreciation for jazz music. I mean, let's face it, uh, over the side effects they're getting from their from their other pharmaceuticals. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I do, when I lecture too, I see adverse events from cannabis are very common, but they're usually very mild and, and very self-limiting. I do think, uh, and I, I talk about this in every lecture, and I think this is part of our physician approach to medical cannabis, that you know, no, there's no drug that's completely safe. Mm -hmm. And even cannabis has a shadow side. And you know, one of the things that we are actively trying to address is is which patients might be at higher risk for cannabis use disorder. And not to be judgmental, mm -hmm. right? These are patients that have gone through a lot of judgment already. Right. But let's learn from the opioid crisis and let's learn from mistakes we've made in the past that how do we uh, create the right expectation with the medicine? How do we use it as an adjunct in, in, in many modalities to treat whatever it is the, the, the issue that the patient is trying to treat uh, so that you know more patients don't fall into the potential for cannabis use disorder? And we've seen yeah. quite a backlash even in the media of the pro-cannabis movement, which I'm obviously a part of. Right, right, right. Well, we just had a panel discussion this morning about, you know, um, when we get in uh, this new legalization, which we assume at some point is going to happen, what will happen to the medical program? We don't want to lose this this medicine, which we fought so hard to get here. You right. know? To get back to another point you made, too, is that when people turn to cannabis, then there's an opportunity there to get them to open up to some other types of treatments, to some of the integrative medicine or functional medicine, acupuncture, all the sorts of different things. And I think that's one of the key things that new cannabis patients really need to grasp is that they're going to be in charge of their health, all of their health, not just choosing which cannabis works the best. You can't sit on the couch, play video games, and eat Pringles potato chips and think you're going to heal you know, whatever it is that ails you, just with cannabis. Do you see a growing acceptance in the cannabis community among all these other kinds of treatments? Yeah, I mean, I think it opens the door for that. Uh, I think you have to have an open mind to come to cannabis in the first place um, it, it, because of all the stigma that surrounds that. Sure. And I think it's our job in the industry to support that. And even Sarah Overby uh, is is really a, a, plays a real pivotive role in our, our Minnesota operation and has created an integrative pain network. So a patient mm. comes to our dispensary, here's a list of uh, practitioners in the area that treat pain. Mm. Um, and so you're aware of that. We've also created a handout on how to naturally engage your endocannabinoid system. Mm -hmm. Many uh, physicians or even scientists might say that's fluff. Uh, I, I don't care. I, I think there is some uh, science to it. And again, you're empowering a patient. Let me have an active role that some of the things on that list are to exercise and to eat well and omega-3 fatty acids and sure. to take a cold shower, I think, is on that list <laughs> uh, to stimulate the endocannabinoid system. But how do we bring that yeah. whole approach to it, which I think is going to have much better success at treating disease and less chance for those bad effects? What else will you be talking about uh, tomorrow on your in your talk about the entourage effect? I mean, I think that I bring into it, um, again, I guess I, I didn't address as much the other side. And there is certainly uh, critics of uh, entourage effect or uh, ensemble or synergy that it's mm -hmm. something made up by the cannabis community to justify a whole plant extract. Um, I have read uh, at least one uh, article 
related specifically to glaucoma, where that uh, entourage might not work for the benefit of the patient, mm. right? And uh, so that's kind of the flip side is that, you know, there isn't incredibly strong evidence that this exists from the scientific community or medical community. And so there's a long way to go to help either support or refute that uh, by, by doing some higher quality research or, again, potentially crowdsourcing data from many the many patients that are utilizing medical cannabis. And I always like to bring that into the picture so that not to give just one side of any story. Sure, sure. Well, and again, we, we talked about that this, this, with all the different variables in there. Is there any science that you said there wasn't a lot? Is there any science to support the entourage effect? Yeah, no, and that's what the I whole will. Whole plant extract. Certainly, we'll go into that tomorrow. Okay. And uh, you know, Ethan Russo, uh, certainly a leader in the field, and um, Taming sure. THC is a great article that kind of goes into some of uh, the aspects of entourage. And uh, I will list, you know, some of the. I won't go into too much detail, but some of the science that does support that. Uh, some of it in vitro, which is not always the best mm-hmm. science. You know, really some fascinating in vitro studies related to glioblastoma very uh, severe uh, uh, cancer um, to other things, even uh, some case reports that were published by, uh, you know, cannabis physicians of, of children utilizing whole plant, children utilizing whole plant to treat epilepsy. Um, and I think that it's only growing as we pay more attention to it. Um, and again, I think uh, what we're all at is, is some form of truth. Mm-hmm. We want to feel better or want our friend to feel better or our family or our patient member to feel better. And yeah. Um, and we have to check our own biases. But I, I certainly see uh, a movement surrounding this to that credit. I see a medicine that's been utilized for 5,000 years in that form. Uh, I see science, scientific studies that are, are backing that. Um, and I don't see a lot of science that's refuting that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do see a medical system that's really um, uh, capitalized on single molecules, which does great for penicillin. Uh, but as we face much more chronic disease, In our everyday life in medicine, uh, we're realizing that uh, kind of quick fix approach is not always best. And I do see something a little bit more subtle uh, that might engage an entourage or ensemble effect be a real key tool uh, even for physicians and and, and anyone in medicine in the future. In a way, if if somebody's using cannabis and then they're using some of the other integrative techniques and modalities, does that create its own sort of entourage effects? But that all of these different treatments plus cannabis is, the, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Does that work for yeah, that as well? I absolutely believe that. And for me, even as a physician in my you know, 20 years of practice, uh, when you can engage a patient, you know, doing things that we know will support that endogenous system in the body, be that whatever that system is, endocrine um, or uh, or uh, the, the uh, endocannabinoid, uh, I think you're going to have a better uh, result with that patient. They're going to feel better overall and be more engaged in that treatment modality. Uh, and we're going to see some interplay between those. And I don't think it'll take a long time before we can fully explain exactly how that happens. Mm. Now, um, in Pennsylvania, we've got 21 qualifying conditions. Would you like to see more conditions added to that list? Or are there some that you think need to be added quickly? I, you know, I'm a fan of, and, and I did. I was an advocate for this in New York. Um, you know, if we're going to have a medical model that a patient has to see a, a provider practitioner to get a certification, uh, it should be up to that practitioner provider to decide: is, is do the benefits outweigh the risks for this patient to utilize this treatment modality? And we do that with any other medication. Um, certainly, there is an FDA approval process, but you'd be amazed at how many medications are used off-label right. for FDA, right. uh, off, off-label for that. And I think it should be at the discretion of the certifying uh, practitioner. Is this a disease state that I, I, I'm willing to stand behind that the benefits outweigh the risks, rather than, you know, I wouldn't say arbitrary, but, you know, there, there really isn't a clear science or medicine behind choosing what, what are the qualifying conditions. Well, and that, that's a really good point, and, and you're, you're leaving uh, health decisions up to politicians who, by their own admission, are not scientists. Yeah. Well, and an added layer to that is, is we all see anyone that spends time uh, working with cannabis is how nuanced this medication is mm-hmm. and how nuanced this plant is and that how nuanced patients are. 
And there might be a patient with a qualifying condition that may not have the most robust evidence, but that you know tries our, our Vireo Green one-to-one capsule uh, or fill-in-the-blank and, and really does well by it. This, this uh, uh, severe muscle spasm or fill-in-the-blank that they've had for 10 years and tried 15 medications is now for the first time under control. Who are we to say that that disease state uh, should not qualify that patient for cannabis? And again, I think that's a great decision made in that in the intimacy of a patient doctor patient practitioner relationship. Would you like to see more uh, study on the endocannabinoid system itself rather than just the, the plant? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm going to be real honest. I was thinking about the, our conversation last night, I think, on the plane. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things I wanted to bring up is that if you read any medical journal, if you read any study or any article, everyone says we need more research. Right. Right? I think that's the one line that everyone says. Right. And, uh, and I had this line I wanted to say to you that, like, for, instead of writing that in every article, I wonder if we all just wrote our, our, our legislator to say, can we take this off of Schedule 1 so we can actually study this? Because I'm banging my head, even personally right now, against this process where we have standardized product, we have thousands of patients, we have a, a, even a research team supporting this and are really struggling to find an IRB to do a randomized control trial because of, of the status uh, Schedule 1. And so, you know, to your point, and I, I jumped on my soapbox there for a second there, but <laughs> That's quite yes, right. uh, and studying the endocannabinoid system, studying, uh, you know, the products that patients are actually using. That's the other issue is that even the, the studies that are funded or are passed through our, you know, the NIH uh, bud and flower. And mm-hmm. again, that's just not, it's not representative of what uh, the tens of thousands, it's not millions. The uh, latest estimate I've seen is over 3 million medical cannabis patients in the United States. They're not using that. Yeah, yeah. The what fascinates me is when we look into the past, we try to think about why were things different in the past pertaining to this plant. Um, and I don't know how true this is, so get your feedback on it. There's a theory that you know cows and sheep and pigs ate more hemp, and that therefore there was more cannabinoids in their meat and in their system when we ate them. Do you think there's any truth to that and that we didn't need so much phytocannabinoids in the past because it was in the food chain? Yeah, I, I haven't heard that uh, theory, and it, yeah, I'm not jumping on, on that one right away, yeah. just to be honest. I think, you know, when I see as a physician far more, and this could be, you know, we talk a lot about like things like adrenal fatigue, right, and but a lot of these kind of uh, nebulous diagnoses, but I, I really think they're a result of our modern lifestyle. Yeah. I think that, it, you know, which could be in part, it certainly is our nutrition, right, and, and, and some of the ingredients and, uh, you know, what's in that nutrition, but I think far more is the amount of stress that we're under, mm-hmm. the lack of sleep that we're under you know the the poor nutrition being part of that the lack of activity and i think that that stresses out many systems in our body mm-hmm. including the endocannabinoid system and the endocannabinoid system is there to try to help us maintain homeostasis in that stress, but is so overwhelmed, I think, that we see these uh, deficiencies and discrepancies that, that result in symptoms. Well, I know that some people are skeptical about cannabis because of this, you know, kind of seems to treat everything. Yeah. But I think uh, you said you studied with Andrew Weil, and I believe he was the one that first started talking about, you know, every disease is essentially inflammation of a certain part of the body. And so when we have our whole bodies inflamed from toxins, from stress, from lack of sleep and all this sort of thing, if if we have a natural anti-inflammatory plant that is going to heal like almost everything. Is, is that a good assessment? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's tough because I think the body is just so complex. And, you know, from from what I know of Dr. Weil, I think he'd probably agree with this as well, but that the body is so complex and this plant is so complex and life is so complex that we sometimes we try to put it in a bucket of inflammation mm-hmm. or uh, stress or, uh, you know, fill in the blank of some type of deficiency uh, when it's really an uh, interplay between all of these, mm-hmm. right? And what mm-hmm. we need to do in medicine and in life is is find those areas that we can uh, influence, that we can impact to help somebody feel well, Mm -hmm. to have a a podcast where we can have a conversation, to look one another in the eye and do our activity of daily living, which is what all of us want. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's sometimes we'll have these different theories, oh, it's inflammation, and it'll constantly change from one to the next. Certainly, inflammation is the basis for the vast majority of diseases I treat, Mm -hmm. but I think it's also much more complex. And I think the art lies in what is something a patient or a person can do to feel well. 
Mm-hmm. And I, I truly believe that cannabis can play a very strong role in that, which is, is why I'm, I'm here today. Right? <laughs> That's right. Well, we're really looking forward to your uh, talk tomorrow. Is there anything about all the, we talked about several different subjects here. Is there anything we talked about that you want to emphasize or any last points you want to make? Yeah, I mean, again, I just, I'll put a plug in for Virio Health that I'm very proud to be a part of this team that, you know, for me is, is really a, a physician-led uh, company, but every member on our team, I mean, we just really bootstrap it to, to bring patients the absolute best products that we can to learn from every patient that comes through the door and take that feedback very seriously to create the best products that, honestly, I feel the best products that are on the market and the containers, not only, you know, the education that surrounds that, but the follow-up and everything that goes that goes into a good medicine um, to, to support patients in, in their journey with medical cannabis. And just real proud to be a, a part of Vireo Health and to offer our starter pack and our extracted oils and, and now even the uh, Indigo Solution, mm-hmm. which is a 19 to 1 CBD to THC yeah. uh, solution that uh, we're now offering here in Pennsylvania. And we certainly hope that our formulary, our spectrum, which we kind of uh, mirrored off the, off the rainbow, expands here as it has done in other states. Well, that's awesome. Well, really happy to have you here at the Mind Body Holistic Healing Expo. And maybe the next expo we can come up with fewer syllables for the name of the, of the expo. <laughs> A pleasure being on. Thank yeah, you thank so you. much, Dr. Dahmer. That concludes this episode of the Dispense Magazine podcast. We hope you enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Stephen Dahmer, Chief Medical Officer with Vireo Health. Join us again on another podcast soon. You can find all of our podcasts on our homepage at dispensemagazine.com. I'm Sven Hosford. Thanks for listening. This podcast is a production of Mindful Medicine, LLC.